Hi everyone! This video is an introduction to cell division. To start, we're going to review cell theory, which you may remember from when we studied cells and organelles. Cell theory is a core principle of biology that has two parts. The first one is that all living things are made of cells, whether we're looking at one tiny unicellular organism or a really large multicellular organism such as yourself. If we zoomed way in on you, we would find that you are made of trillions of individual little cells. The second part of cell theory is that all cells come from other cells. So you may be many cells now, but if we went back to the very beginning of you, we would find that you were just one cell originally, and then that one cell became two cells, and those two cells became four, four became eight, until one day you were the many trillions of cells you are today. How did they do that? Well, this is where cell division comes in. This is how cells come from other cells. And the basic idea behind cell division is that one cell can copy its DNA and then pull apart those copies to produce cells that are more or less similar to the first cell they started with. And it depends on what kind of division we're looking at as to how similar they are. But there are three main types of cell division. The first one is binary fission. And this is a type of cell division that is used by prokaryotic cells for asexual reproduction. And we'll take a closer look at this process in just a moment. The next one is mitosis, which is used by eukaryotic organisms for different things, depending on what kind of organisms they are. If it's a unicellular organism, they'll be using mitosis for asexual reproduction, which makes sense. If you're a unicellular organism, such as an amoeba, and you divide into two cells, well, now you're two amoebas, and so you have effectively reproduced. But for multicellular organisms, such as ourselves, we use mitosis for growth and tissue repair. The last type of cell division is meiosis. And this is a type of cell division that is used by eukaryotic organisms for a very special purpose. They only use it for sexual reproduction. So this is the type of cell division that is used only for making gametes, or eggs and sperm. And we're going to come back to this type of cell division in a few weeks. But for now, we're going to focus on binary fission very briefly, and then we're going to spend the next couple of classes on mitosis. So let's take a closer look at binary fission. Again, this is the cell division that is used by prokaryotes for asexual reproduction. And if it's the prokaryotes, remember, those are the organisms in the domains bacteria and archaea. So they're relatively simple critters, so this is a relatively simple process. They only have one circular chromosome, there are no organelles to worry about, and so there's just not a lot that goes into it. So in this process, one cell will give rise to two genetically identical cells. Let's take a, a look at how this happens. Let's say we start with one parent cell here, and again, parent just means it's the one we start with. The first thing it has to do is copy its DNA. So it's gonna go through DNA replication, copy that one circular chromosome. We've got the different copy in a different color so you can see it. And you can also see that the cell is starting to stretch here. It's starting to elongate and pull apart. And as the process continues, a new cell wall, a new prokaryotic cell wall, will start to be built between those copied chromosomes as they pull apart until they get to the point where they're completely separate. And at that point, we'd have two daughter cells that are genetically identical to the parent cell. And that's really all you need to know about binary fission. It's a straightforward and simple process. So simple that some types of bacteria can actually complete the whole process in less than 20 minutes. But cell division is going to be more complicated in eukaryotes because eukaryotes have a lot more going on. They have multiple chromosomes. They also have organelles, most notably that nucleus, which means there's a membrane around the chromosomes, which can, is going to make it a little tougher to separate the copies of the chromosomes. So this means that eukaryotic cells are going to have to do a little more prep work to get ready for cell division. So what do they have to do? Well, one of the first things they have to do is replicate their DNA, duplicate their chromosomes. And yes, this occurs in prokaryotes before cell division also, but it looks a little bit different in eukaryotic cells. So to review something we saw in class a little while ago, if we start with one linear eukaryotic chromosome, after it goes through DNA replication, we'll end up with a chromosome that looks like this. And again, these two sides are known as sister chromatids. So that's what the chromosome is going to look like after DNA replication in the eukaryotic cell. 
But not only does it have to do that, it also has to condense those chromosomes because these chromosomes are really long and stringy and there's lots and lots of them in there. It's going to make it difficult to separate them all neatly. And so in this process of condensing the chromosomes, they coil up into this tightly packed or shorter form. So in this diagram over here, we can see that double helix of DNA winding and coiling itself up into this really tightly packed form. And when you see chromosomes on TV or in textbooks, they're often shown in this form because it's the only time when we can see them under the microscope when they're in this short, fat, fuzzy form after they've gone through this condensing process. Another way to think about it is if you had many really long pieces of yarn, maybe 46 really long pieces of yarn if we're comparing it to the, the human genome, and you needed to separate all of them evenly after copying them, it's going to be really difficult if you have all these really long pieces of yarn that are each hundreds of feet long. But it's going to be easier if you roll them up into little short balls of yarn. It's going to be easier to move them around. So this condensing process makes it easier to separate the chromosomes. What else does eukaryotic cell division involve? Well, if we're going to be able to separate those chromosomes, we need to get them out of the membrane that's around them. So it also involves temporary disintegration of, disintegration of the nuclear envelope. That nuclear envelope you can see here breaking down at the beginning of cell division. And this allows the copied chromosomes to separate from each other and move to opposite ends of the cell because they're no longer stuck inside that membrane. And if those chromosomes are going to be moving to opposite ends of the cell, they need tracks to move along. So here in this diagram here, you can see these blue lines. These are the tracks that the chromosomes are going to move along. And this is something we've seen before. We learned in our cell unit that when objects need to move inside the cell, they move along microtubules. So these are microtubules here, and this specific structure that's set up in cell division that looks like this, this particular shape of microtubules, is known as a spindle. So once the nuclear envelope is out of the way and the spindle is in place, those sister chromatids are ready to separate and move to opposite ends of the cell. But how do they do that? Well, Let's take a closer look at the sister chromatids themselves. If we could zoom in way in on them, we would see that they actually have these special structures here, one on each side, that are called kinetochores. And kinetochores are these structures located at the centromeres of the, the chromosome, and they contain motor proteins, something we've seen before. So as you know, motor proteins can walk along microtubules. So these kinetochores will line up with the spindle fibers, the microtubules, and they will actually walk along the microtubules. So here you can see that kinetochore with the motor protein on it walking along the microtubules. And the two kinetochores are going to move in opposite directions. So this kinetochore here is going to move in that direction. And this kinetochore here is going to move in that direction. And this pulls apart those two sister chromatids, pulls apart those two sides. So now that you have all the background information about cell division in eukaryotes, we're ready to take a closer look at one of the actual eukaryotic cell division processes, which is mitosis. So again, this is the cell division process that is used by eukaryotic cells for asexual reproduction, growth, and tissue repair. For example, if you scrape your finger, you're not without that skin for the rest of your life. It does eventually grow back, and the way that it does that is by replacing cells using this mitosis process. And in mitosis, generally one cell divides to produce two genetically identical cells that are identical to each other and identical to the original cell. So it's really important that the chromosomes divide evenly. In this example here, we've got a cell that starts with two chromosomes, one red one and one blue one. And at the end, the two cells that are produced each also have one red one and one blue one. And that's a really simple example for a creature that only has two chromosomes. But something much more complicated like you, with your 46, you can imagine that it's going to be a little tougher to make sure that each cell that gets produced has the exact right number of chromosomes. One more thing we need to look at is how does this fit into that cell cycle? In class a little bit earlier this year, we were looking at this cell cycle. And to do a quick review, a new cell would be created right around this point in the cycle. And then it would go through this G1 phase where it would grow and make proteins. If it's given the signal to move on in its life cycle and divide, the first thing it needs to do is 
replicate its DNA or copy its chromosomes in this S phase, and then it's going to spend a little time in this G2 phase making other preparations for cell division before it gets to this M phase, and this is where one cell will divide into two cells. And this M phase, or the mitotic phase, actually involves two different processes. The first one is mitosis, which refers specifically to the division of the chromosomes, so separating those sister chromatids. But then we also need to separate everything else in the cell, and that happens in a phase called cytokinesis, which is a division of the cytoplasm, the organelles, the membranes, everything else besides the chromosomes. And another vocabulary word you need to know is something called interphase. And when we're focusing on just the M phase, the mitotic phase, we'll usually lump everything else together as interphase. So G1, S, and G2, we can just call interphase. We can say either we're looking at the mitotic phase or we're looking at interphase. So that's another word you need to know. And mitosis itself also gets further divided up into different phases. So you can see here these different phases that are all part of mitosis. And these phases are defined based on the status and location of the chromosomes, the nuclear envelope, and the spindle. In class, we're going to take a closer look at exactly what happens in each one of these phases. So until then, take care of yourself, take care of each other.